How many of you are ready for Christmas? She was the first one. I said, how many of you are ready for And she's, So you bought all your presents for everybody? Oh, you're just ready for the presents to come to you. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, well, I will confess my house is not even decorated at this point other than it's normal rustic dust. Look. Um, that's, we got to fix that. <clears throat> I'm putting that in. You're in charge of it. Got it? Um, whether for good or for bad, it doesn't, I, I think there's a, a case to be made for each. <clears throat> there is a preparation that we go through for Christmas, isn't there? Um, and by the way, if you're one of those people that plays Christmas music before Thanksgiving, <laughs> I am praying the Spirit of God all over you. I'm sure it's in here somewhere that you shall not play Christmas music until after Thanksgiving meal. Oh. Oh. That's, that's, that's like one of the prime exhibits in my zoo of pet peeves. Oh. But we do go through a process of preparation, right? Only one person said, yeah, all of you guys, do you, did, how many of you just don't decorate? Yeah. Well, okay, wait a minute, let, let me rephrase. How many of you, uh, your house is not decorated? Can I know that your wife is doing the decorating? So, I yours is not? We just didn't undecorate for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> wow! <laughs> I'm not even sure how to answer. <laughs> we'll, we'll be praying for Norma, too. <laughs> but there's a process that we go through where, uh, you know, whether we decorate our house or not, um, whether we listen to Christmas music to get ourselves in the spirit, um, buying or making gifts and wrapping gifts, um, there's a process that we go through, right? Okay. Now, having said that, let me re-ask my question. How many are ready for Christmas? Just this time she was really slow. She's like... <laughs> because see, uh, by the way, according to the Jewish calendar, what is the next feast? Hanukkah. Does anybody know when Hanukkah starts? The 22nd, evening of the 22nd, okay? Why do I even bring this up? Well, I figure if Jesus celebrated Hanukkah, that, uh, you know, that's something that we might want to take note of, all right? Um, just a little tidbit of information for you. Uh, we know that Jesus was in Jerusalem, and it says for the Feast of Lights, okay? Uh, that would be Hanukkah. So just something for you to file away in the recesses of your brain, um, our Lord and Savior celebrated Hanukkah. Uh, we celebrate Christmas, the birth of Jesus Christ. Uh, the actual celebrating of Christmas didn't come around for several centuries after um, the first century. Uh, and it became a thing because a lot of the Christians in that day were losing touch with the fact that Jesus was fully man. Okay? They, they accepted his divine nature, but they lost sight of the fact that he could only do what he did if he were human. Okay? And so they, they instituted, well, they already uh, celebrated uh, Good Friday and the Resurrection Sunday. That was, that was a good thing. But then they started focusing also on his birth of a human woman as a human baby and then growing up as a man. And somewhere along the way, we lost sight of this, okay? We lost sight of the significance of these celebrations, okay? Now, I don't want you to put your hands up, okay? You don't need to put your hands up. But how many of you would have a good Christmas if there were no gifts, 
given or received. No stockings. No Christmas tree. Is that a question or are you no, celebrating? I'm still celebrating. Good. No feast. No festival. No focus on family because Christmas, when a lot of families come together, how many of you would still be able to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ? All right, send your presents my way. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But see, this, this is something that we have become so culturally desensitized to that a lot of times we don't even realize what's happening. We're celebrating, uh, I have a brother that, that refuses to put up a Christmas tree, okay? Um, he and I have discussed this theologically. He uh, refers to the passage of the prophet that says, uh, you know, bringing your offerings of silver and gold and placing them at the foot of the tree. I tell him, you're just cheap. <laughs> he is cheap, okay? To be honest with you, he and his wife, they don't buy cards for each other. On his birthday, she takes him down to the store and pulls out a card that says what she wants. He reads it and then puts it back. Okay? That's why I call him cheap. All right? So, um, I, I, just heard a lot, I just heard a lot of people go, cha-ching! Oh, yeah! All right? So, um, I subscribe to the theory in uh, Colossians that whether you celebrate a new moon feast or a Sabbath, do it unto God. <coughs> oh, hang on just one second. Hey, Finn. Come here. Oh, you got to see him. Come here. Oh. Is that not cute? Little beanie hat. Little puppy cheeks. He loves it. You know, sometimes I, I think that you guys don't impress him. <laughs> because he just stares at you. Okay. But did you know that God made preparations for that first Christmas? <clears throat> did you know that? What did he do? What preparations did he do prior to the birth of Jesus Christ? I mean, we, we know there were prophecies. There were prophecies that were given 600 plus years prior to his birth, about his birth. He sent John the Baptist. He sent John the Baptist. Yep. He notified people, the angels. Okay. What, what, what were you saying? Appeared to Mary. Yep. The star. The star. Here to Joseph. But what about yeah? They, he um, caused the census to be taken, which would cause them to go from Nazareth. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Because the prophecy said that the the Savior, the, the Messiah, would be born in Bethlehem. Um, but I want to I want to look at a little bit bigger picture. Um, who was? Who was in charge at this time in the world, uh, at least the Western world? It was Rome. They appointed Herod, uh, who had very little Jewish in him, but he knew how to make friends of powerful people. Uh, Rome was in charge. Now, it's interesting, as far as preparation, uh, Paul writes that when the time was right, God sent his son. Okay. When the time was right. Now, we think about this. Because we are on this side of the coming of the Messiah, it's done. Okay. So we're looking back to an event that has already happened. Whereas prior to his birth, those that knew the will of God, those that knew the plans of God were looking forward. Okay. So now, we're kind of in the same boat with them in that we're looking forward to the second coming. Okay. We know that he came as the lamb. Okay. He came uh, gentle and meek as a lamb. He was uh, led like a lamb to the slaughter. Um, but we're looking forward 
to the coming of the Lion of Judah. Um, so God put a number of things in play so that the message of his son, the message of the gospel, the good news, would be able to go out into the world. Now, just, just a little bit of history for you. Um, even today, Israel is situated in a key strategic point, more so in the past, because it was right in the middle of the trade routes from Egypt and Africa, connecting over to the Middle East for Persia, Media, um, Babylon, uh, Assyria, and then even going up and around into what is modern day Turkey and into Europe. Okay, so, so Israel was placed strategically, and I believe absolutely with purpose, in that place because it was a significant crossroads in the world at that time. Now, God called Israel the nation that through them they would bless the world. Now, one of the things that you'll find when God called them out of Egypt and he established them as a nation, you will see that God made sure that everyone was covered and everyone was protected by his law. Okay? And this was the widows, the orphans, uh, the sojourner, those that chose to live in the land that were not Jewish. All of them were protected by the same laws that protected the, the, you know, the elite, the Jews. But they were put in this place because God wanted them to show the world him. As people came up and traders came up from Egypt and others from Assyria and, and Chaldea and uh, the Hittites, as all of these people were coming, Israel was, was like, do you ever see those guys wear sandwich boards? How many of you know what a sandwich board is? Okay, for, for the younger people, it's, it's the, the board on the front, and then there's a strap and goes to a board on the back, and you're sandwiched in between the boards. Okay, how many of you see, have seen those at the corner at the stoplight? You pull up at the stoplight. Okay, or you see the man with the sign, we'll work for food. Um, or the ones that are more honest that will say, you know, I'm not going to work for you, give me money. Okay, um, I had a, a pastor of a church that I attended for a brief time that whenever he saw one of these people, he would actually get out of his car and he'd go up to him and they'd say, uh, you know, I have some work I need around the house, can mow the lawn, you can rake the leaves, whatever it was. And if they said no, he would go to the trunk of his car and pull out a sign that said he's lying. And he'd stand next to the guy. Okay. Now, I, I honestly, um, it took you a moment to catch up, didn't you? Um, that's between him and God. I, I would not do that myself, but that's between him and God. But Israel is like that at a stoplight. A stoplight at the crossroads of, of cultures and civilizations and, and, and they're here at this place as, as the traffic is going up and down the King's Highway. Uh, they are supposed to be there to show the world their God, the one true God. Okay. Now we know even at the height of their glory under David and then under Solomon, this was really not carried out the way that God had called them to do. All right? For whatever reason, it just wasn't done. Okay? So as we move forward in our history, we see that uh, God has uh, punished Israel. He's punished Judah. He's called them back into the land. Uh, we, we know that uh, Alexander the Great actually fostered a, a one system uh, of government that uh, spread from what today is Greece and Macedonia, wrapped all the way around to Egypt, and then extended all the way out even into the borders of India. Uh, it was a massive, massive empire. Uh, and, but one of the unique things that came out of that was that for the first time since Babel, the Tower of Babel, there was a common language, okay, Greek. Now, 
For those of you that, that don't know a lot about Greek, I don't know a lot about Greek. Uh, the more I know, the more I realize I don't know. Okay? So I'm, I'm not speaking as, as a uh, uh, Greek expert here. But Greek is an incredibly versatile language. Okay? Much more so, much more clear than English. Okay? English... English stinks as a language, you know, uh, because it, it, it really, we don't say things well, which I think is probably 90% of the arguments that people get into is because we're not communicating well, okay? And especially with emails and texts and things <coughs> like that where you can't look at someone and see their body language, okay? Because it's amazing how much you can read into a line of text. Wow, why are they mad at me? So, um, for the first time, a common language is heard throughout uh, Europe, the southern parts of Europe, and, and actually as the Romans come to power, they extend those boundaries up further into Europe, and they carry it all the way around to modern-day Spain. Um, we see that they kept... Greek as the common language, okay? That was considered the, the, the language of trade. And so, for the first time since the Tower of Babel, we have a common language that can be understood from Spain all the way up and around through Italy, over to Greece, around into um, modern day, what would be uh, Syria, well, yeah, Turkey is up there, but uh, Syria and Lebanon and Jordan, and Israel, and then coming down into Egypt, and then extending. So for the first time, a large portion of the world can communicate and be understood in one language. Okay, Why is that important? Well, it's important because how will they believe unless they hear? And how will they hear unless it is preached? Okay, Now, we look at the Bible, and we see it with our English uh, eyes, the English language, okay? But what we don't really get is that uh, a lot of the New Testament, even though it was written in Greek, it was actually communicated in Aramaic, or Hebrew, or Latin, and then there was a lot that was done in Greek as well. As a matter of fact, what we have handed down to us is the Greek translation of things that were done in other languages, okay? So, why is it important that there is a common language? The gospel, when, when God told them that they needed to go, and Jesus said, you go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the world. There was a language that they could speak and would be understood in a large portion of the world at that time. Okay? Why is that important? Because the gospel can be shared. Okay? There's, there's no language barrier. Okay. But then, uh, after, after Alexander did this, and then, you know, when he died, the kingdom broke up, and I, I encourage you to do your history, um, look at what's going on, read the Maccabees, see what happened there. Uh, God did an incredible thing. Um, but the Romans come along, all right? And there was an argument, there was a fight between two brothers uh, as to who was going to be the leader in Israel, and... Uh, uh, I believe his name was Aristobulus and uh, John Hyrcanus. Um, and the one brother was sided with the Sadducees and was trapped in the Temple Mount. He was within the Temple. The other brother couldn't get in and he couldn't get out. And so this, the one in the Temple sent a message to Rome and said, Hey, you know, it'd be really cool if you came and helped us. And, and <coughs> Rome showed up and they talked to the other brother and ended up ousting the one that called them there. Anyway. What, why is this significant? Because whereas uh, Alexander went out and he conquered a bunch of nations and he brought them in and he brought a common language, he also brought uh, a new thought, Western thinking. And you know what, people? Western thinking stinks when you try to interpret the Bible. Okay? Because the Bible was not written predominantly by Western thinkers. It was written by Eastern thinkers. Okay? 
So uh, there's this, this new uh, Western thought that's brought out, then Rome comes into play, and Rome does something even more so, even better than what Alexander did. Rome builds roads. Okay? Rome builds roads. Now, why is that important? Uh, there's, there's two reasons for that. The first thing is you can go from Jerusalem all the way around the corner up into Corinth or, or down around into Rome all on paved roads. Okay? You're not going to have to traverse any of it on paths. You can do... Now, Rome did this for a very selfish reason. They wanted a quick way to get their armies from point A to point B. Right? And because they knew the value of speed. And so they, they built all these roads, a lot of which are being used today, a lot of which you can still see remnants of today, uh, all throughout Europe and uh, down into um, Israel and down into, even down into uh, Egypt. So now, not only do we have a common language that the gospel can be conveyed and understood in, we have a way to get from point A to point B. Okay? Easily. It's accessible. But then there's this third thing that Rome did. Now, Rome did a lot of terrible things, folks. Okay? They, they did some horrific things, uh, especially under certain Caesars. They did horrific things. But Rome did... Now, I'm going to segue for just a minute. Bear with me. Um, God will use whomever he wills to accomplish his purposes. Okay? That's his right as being the sovereign creator of all things. Um, we know that God uh, has used people to fulfill his purposes. Uh, we know that prior to uh, Jerusalem ever falling, a prophecy was given that Cyrus would let Israel go back to their land uh, and, and talk about a self-fulfilling prophecy, uh, Cyrus becomes the king, and they bring him this prophecy, and they show it to him, and he goes, oh, well, who am I to not follow through with this prophecy? And, and he sent Israel back to the promised land. Um, but God used these horrific people, uh, the things that they did, he used them to further his purposes. Because with the roads also came what's called Pax Romana, okay? The peace of Rome. Now, we don't give this a lot of thought where we are uh, because we have such a small population in this area compared to other areas. And <coughs> trust me, um, having spent time in Denver and Houston and even Oklahoma City, you know, our rush 10 minutes is nothing compared to their rush days. Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't have rush hours. It just starts at like 6.30, bing, everything stops until about 6.30 that night, and then you can actually go on the roads again. It's just, it's just amazing. But we don't really think about our safety a whole lot because we don't have a lot of things that bigger, uh, that cities and, and bigger populations have to deal with. Okay? But when you consider that in this area, uh, stretching around, all the way around the east side of the Mediterranean. There were so many different countries. There were so many different possibilities for getting in trouble. Uh, you would have this king would be fighting with this king, and either king uh, may not like you and, and could do whatever they wanted with you. Uh, brigands and, and, and highwaymen, and there, there's just all kinds of things. Jesus, you know why Jesus told the story about the prodigal son? I'm sorry, not the prodigal son, about the Good Samaritan. <coughs> There's a number of reasons, but the key to this story is that he was set upon by thieves, right? Now, Jesus always used, uh, in his par parables, he always used things that people that he was speaking to could relate to. If you notice, if you pay attention, when he's up in the, the, around the area of Galilee, he uses a lot of fishing parables because everybody up there they, that was their job, that was their living, they fished. And then as he came further down south and he got away from the Sea of Galilee, he told more stories about farming, okay, and, and shepherding, okay. Why? Because those people weren't fishermen, 
and those stories would not connect with them, it wouldn't resonate. So when Jesus is talking about, when he's telling you any parable, you should automatically kind of perk up and say, okay, why is he saying this to this group of people? Okay? Because we get context so wrong so many times, folks. Uh, we pick and choose the scriptures that we want, and we disregard the others that, that either don't make sense or we don't like. It's all God's word. Everything from Genesis 1-1 all the way to the end of Revelation. It's all God's word. Okay? Um, so, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, uh, the, this man is set upon by, by thieves, and they, they take his stuff, and they pummel him, and, and leave him for dead on the side of the road. Um, won't go further into that, par uh, that parable, um, but Jesus told that story because they would understand the threat. Okay? Pax Romana guaranteed peace within the empire. You, if you were set upon, you could go to a local magistrate, you could, you could talk to them, they would enforce peace. Uh, this is part of why uh, when Jesus was, was arrested by the Jewish leaders, they wanted Rome to take responsibility. Okay? They didn't want the burden of responsibility because there were so many people that followed Jesus and believed he was a prophet and even believed that he was the son of God. Everything had to be done on the sly. They fulfilled their purposes, also fulfilling scripture, by turning him over to Rome to keep their hands clean. Okay? So, in the Pax Romana, you can now travel all the way across the breadth and the width of the land on Roman roads, so you can get there quickly. You can do that in relative safety, and you have a language that is common all the way throughout, so that when the message is taken out, it can be received and understood. See, these are just three things that God put into place so that when the gospel came to be, it could be taken all over the world, spoken and understood and received. Now, those are just three things. Those are three big things, but he also did something that's, that's a little bit more unique. Uh, with the diaspora, with the scattering of Israel, um, specifically the ten tribes of Israel in the north, uh, we find uh, at this time that there were a number of Jewish, for lack of a better word, I'm just going to call them colonies. Uh, there were a, a number of centers where Jews congregated. Okay? And, and we know this at Jesus' time because uh, he's speaking in the temple and he says, now I'm with you, but, but tomorrow I'm not going to be with you. And, and where I'm going, you cannot come. And, and the Jews are going, well, is he going to go to the, the, the Jews in Greece? And... and talk to them there. Um, now, why is, why is this relevant? Why is this significant? Because Jews in different communities were first, they were open to the prophecies being fulfilled because they understood the prophecies. They were open to receiving those that came in with the, the message of the way. But they also had interactions with the community around them so that when these people came in, they were able to, through the Jewish community in a particular city, they were able to get, gain an audience and gain acceptance and, and have a place to springboard. Okay? Read through Acts. When Paul and Barnabas first went out on their missionary journey, what was the first thing they did coming into a city? They went to the synagogue. Okay? And they started there. All right? So, so we see the diaspora, we see these... Uh, colonies of Jews. We see that there's ways to get to and from these different areas. We see there's a language that they're understood. We see that for the most part there is peace that you can travel without fear. And, and, and one other thing, because the, uh, the Jews had spread so far throughout the kingdom, uh, the idea of a monotheistic faith was not unheard of. Okay? Now you, you look you look at the Greeks, lots and lots of gods. You look at the Romans, who were too lazy to come up with their own, so they just took the Greek gods and renamed them. Okay? And lots and lots of gods. 
but there's this idea with the, the Jews being spread throughout the land and, and actually with some of the philosophy that the Greeks brought forward, there was this idea of monotheism. What if there's only one God, okay? And so when the message came, while they may not believe it at the first, while they may not uh, believe that there is a, only one God, that at least that idea is not brand new to them. It's something that they've heard of before. See, God was a carefully establishing everything that needed to be done so that when Christ came and he fulfilled his purposes, the gospel could go out like wildfire. And the gospel did go out like wildfire. God had to do some more things because when Jesus ascended and the Jews, they came back, what did they do? They settled down in Jerusalem. And God said, no, out. Take the message out. And I'll tell you what, guys, when God tells you to do something, do it the first time, okay? Because God will get your attention. And if he can get it through just prompting in your spirit, if he can get it with just speaking to you, you're going to be so much better off. Because see, the, the, the first Christians, the, the apostles and the disciples that were in Jerusalem, they weren't going out. So what happened? Oh, shout it out there. Persecution. They got hit. And they scattered. Boom. All right? Now, it fulfilled God's purposes. Could his purposes have been fulfilled if they had just chosen to go on their own? Absolutely. That would have been the better way, wouldn't it? But God's purposes will come to pass. And God said, go out. So, boop. Out they went. All right? So, let's bring this all back together here. By the way, this is not the notes that I have for today's message. Um, and let's bring this all back together. How do we get from there to here? I'm, I'm going to issue you a challenge, and I, I hate this because then I'm going to be responsible for doing the challenge as well. Okay? This week, this week, I want you to do two things. All right? Two things. Um, first thing is, I want you to do a kindness completely unexpected for someone. But it, it, they have to understand that you are doing a kindness. Okay? And, and no, it doesn't have to be you trying to soak in the glory. That's not what I'm saying. I want you to do a kindness. Now, for some of you, uh, this, this is going to be more difficult than others. But I want it to be, that's the second part of this, I want it to be something that costs you. Not necessarily money. But it takes you out of your comfort zone. Okay? It, it takes you beyond the realm of which you normally operate. Okay. So I want you to do a kindness, but I want it to be a kindness that comes at personal cost. It may be uh, something as simple as engaging someone in a conversation. Um, poor Thaddeus. That poor kid. Um, he, he's pretty outgoing. I'm not really sure why, but for some reason or another, people talk to me. Um, and a lot of times it catches me off guard because I'm, I'm still wired to not be a talker. I don't lap it up, go ahead. But when I'm out in public, I, I tend to be in my head, not really paying attention to the goings on around me. I'm getting better at this, but it still throws me when, uh, you know, you, somebody just opens up and talks. Now, the other day, we were at Pizza Hut, and um, that was, that was a, just a blessed time of fellowship. <coughs> Got to be with Benji and Shay and their kids, uh, and Brian and Ruth and Deucalion, but we came in, uh, it was Thaddeus and I at first, and uh, Ruth and Brian were in their van because Deucalion was sleeping, so they weren't going to get him up until Benji and Shay showed up. They were going to come a little bit later. Notice I said a little bit later. 
But they did show up and we did eat. Uh, ben got caught up in doing something and it took a little bit longer than he was expecting. But as Thaddeus and I come in, one of the waitresses comes up and she just starts talking. You know, you ever have those moments where your brain freezes and it feels like an hour has gone by? <laughs> That's kind of what happened. Um, she was pregnant, she was very obviously pregnant, and so I just asked her when her baby was due, and then, whoosh. <laughs> I had an opportunity to witness. I had an opportunity to speak into her life. It took me a bit. Because I had to change my path of thinking. I'm thinking pizza. <laughs> you know, my, my thoughts really didn't go much beyond pizza. <laughs> what kind of pizza do I need to get? What, do, what does Benjamin like? What does Shay like? I know the kids all like pepperoni pizza on a hand-tossed with buttery garlic crust. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I know the kids like it. So, so that's kind of where my brain was going. And then when she opened up, I had to go... <laughs> Okay. Now, it could be something as simple as that. It could be something more complicated. Uh, I, I don't know. It could, uh, but I do want you to know, it's got to come out of your normal routine. It's got to come out uh, outside of your comfort zone. Do a kindness and do it outside of your comfort zone. Now, you're not to tell anybody about it. See, that's between you and God, okay? Um, I might ask you, did you do a kindness this week? You can say yes or no. I'm not going to ask for any details, okay? But see, now the, the onus for this, the burden for this is on my shoulders as well because I can't very well challenge you and not take up the challenge myself. So as we move into, and we're, we're, we're actually, I guess we're kind of in the middle of moving into the middle of the Christmas season, I want us to represent Christ and the purposes of why we are celebrating, I want to reflect that and shine that out into the community around us, okay? And, and be honest, because if your mentality about Christmas is still about gifts and trees and tinsel and, and things like that, you know, hey, we all started there. Because I, I remember being a little kid. And my poor parents, I did not sleep, I typically sleep only two hours at a shot. If I go three hours at one shot, that's a great round of sleeping. But I've been that way since I was a kid. And when I was little, you guys can laugh if you want, but my, my parents sent us to bed at 6 o'clock. Yes. That was my first clue that my dad didn't like kids, <laughs> okay? Because we had to go to bed. Basically, Dad showed up from work, we said hi, and off to bed we went, okay? But the, the downside of that is we also got up between 4.30 and 5 every morning, okay? And we used to sit and watch color bars and listen to tone. You guys remember that? When the TV was off, you know, there was, nothing was being aired, and so you'd turn it on and you'd watch the color bars and listen to the tone, you'd turn it down real quiet, and, and then you'd be there, you know, you were ready to go, and, TV actually came on like two hours later. Uh, but my poor parents, after they sent all the kids to bed, my dad, would, each of us would have one present that was left out, and, and my poor dad, he had to build so many things. Um, I remember this Christmas because I woke up as my parents were heading to bed. Uh, they had been up uh, building my, my brother's, uh, he had one of those football games where you, you guys vibrate and and it was big, and it was dumb. Uh, my other brother got an RC racetrack. <laughs> the thing was great. I got uh, the six million dollar or the million dollar man's six million dollar man's inflatable base with uh, Steve Austin and and the bad guy. And you could look through the back of Steve Austin's head and see with this bionic mission. <laughs> my sister. Uh, <coughs> hey. This was my gift, not yours. Yeah. My sister got Barbie's townhouse. That was about this tall. My sister was about this tall. But the townhouse was like this. Okay, so my parents, my dad, spent all evening building those things. 
Well, I woke up as they were going to their room to go to bed. I jumped out of bed and I'm like, Christmas! Which, for some reason, woke up my brother. And, and mom was like, no, 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 no. And, oh, too late. So at 1.30 in the morning, we went out and we did Christmas. Okay. Um, I have to tell you, for many, many years, that time of the day, God was the furthest thing from my mind. Okay. I, I loved when the nativity came out. I loved laying on the floor and looking at the baby Jesus. But man, when it came to uh, looking at the nativity and opening presents, presents won out every time. Okay. So I want to issue this challenge that you do one kindness, okay, and the person you're doing the kindness for has to know you're doing them a kindness, um, and it has to be something taking you out of your comfort zone. Okay? Is that fair? It doesn't matter whether it's fair or not, I'm still going to ask you to do it. Uh, all right. 